Great. So lovely to see everyone. Uh, this is uh, the first week in a series we're doing, looking at the five ethical precepts of Buddhism. And we have a dill. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're looking at the five ethical precepts of Buddhism, and we're doing that over a period of six weeks. So this is week number one, and I'm going to um, talk a bit about how mind conditions our experience, the importance of uh, mind uh, in Buddhism, and the importance of awareness uh, in practicing uh, in practicing this really really key. Uh, part of a Buddhist life, which is an, your ethical, your ethical life, your uh, connection with other people, and connection with the world, uh, and actually connection with yourself. <laughs> That's where it starts, doesn't it? it? Starts with your connection with yourself, and then out into the world. So our the ethical dimension of our life, the um, the relationships, and uh, the way that we connect with the world, and in fact create the world that we uh, dwell in and that we live in, the importance of um, awareness uh, in this. So I'm gonna kick us off. Uh, and then over then the next five weeks after that, we've got Samudra Gosha next week. Uh, <laughs> he's going to be talking about why have ethical precepts. Tune in. Uh, and then after that, Kula Priya, who's not here this week, will be talking about the creative mind. And uh, this is a, a particular way of uh, looking at um, our experience in a Buddhist practice, actually, that comes from Sangharakshita, our teacher. And I just think it gives us so much scope for a, um, a much more sort of um, personal uh, exploratory, alive way of practicing Buddhism. It's like a, a creative response to ourselves and the world, uh, uh, seeing where that leads us and bringing ourselves more and more, more and more parts of ourselves to our Buddhist practice and to life itself. Uh, and then uh, the following week, Savatanyana, who I believe is online. Hi, Savatanyana. Uh, we'll be uh, looking at, shall we be looking at the third precept, beyond guilt. So uh, any ex-Catholics in the room? This is quite useful. <laughs> but anyhow, we've all got that, haven't we? We've all got that authority projection. So how can we go beyond guilt? Uh, Padma Jata uh, will then be looking at uh, speaking like a Buddha. I could do with that one as well. I'll I'll be here every week. <laughs> and then Sadaraja, who's online as well. Hi, Sadaraja. Uh, will be taking us beyond ethics with an exploration of the fifth precept. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, we're going to be unpacking the five precepts, exploring them. Uh, and hopefully uh, every week we'll sort of take something home with us to sort of put into practice throughout the following week. Not uh, necessarily something huge, but just something to explore, something to explore, uh, you know, as we go about our day-to-day -day life and a way to sort of shine a bit of a light on our ethical practice. So the series is called Not About Being Good. And the title comes from a, a book by a woman called Subhadra Mati, and I have left mine just outside, um, uh, by Subhadra Mati, who's an order member who used to uh, teach around the London Buddhist Centre a lot. But actually, she, um, she uh, well, I was going to say, she didn't really move out of London. She decided not to have a home for a couple of years. So she's just uh, being a wandering teacher. Uh, around and about whoever needs her she's uh, she's going there and she's spending time so uh, so I, mean, I hope she will get her to Cambridge uh, but she's a great great teacher uh, but she's written this book uh, uh, about Buddhist ethics called not about being good and so I am going to throw that question out to you and you online uh, what do you reckon this title means in relation to Buddhist ethics not about being good. So that's our first question. And if we could get into groups of three, so Stephen, you could set, or whoever's doing that, set that up. Uh, so if we get into groups of three, and just we'll just have about uh, six minutes, not very long. So just, you know, your first thoughts, 
what do you think what do you think this means what's the implication of the title in relation to ethics not about being good okay just turn to the people around you you can have pairs or fours if necessary Pairs are good. Pairs are fine. Just tossing pairs. Hey guys, I wasn't expecting groups this fast. Give me two seconds. <laughs> she threw me. <laughs> All right, I think these are only about five or six minute groups, so I'll pop you out when she rings the bell. All right, have fun.
Hey, Jeanette, is it just me or are we all muted? We can't, I can't hear. I, I just sent them a message, it's muted. I think she's just closing the groups up on their end too. So mm -hmm. I think it's normal. As long as it wasn't just me, that's Yeah, okay. no, not you. Okay. You have to do this because I tell you to do it. You're, you're good because you're told to be good, like a small child's told, oh, don't yeah. eat the sweets, you don't eat the sweets. But you really, the child really wants to eat the sweets. So in Buddhism, it's about what's going on inside your mind as well. Mm. You know, you're not behaving in an ethical way because someone's telling you to. You, you behave that way because you choose to. Mm. It's like you have the freedom and you choose to, and you're, you're doing it because you want to, mm -hmm. because someone's telling you to. Okay, yeah. And was there a third? Uh, I mean, one idea was that if you polarize what's good and what's not good, then you are very judgmental, which can be prevented oh, of yeah. being empathetic to others. And also, perhaps the idea of Buddhist practice is more focused on becoming rather than being. Mm. So it's not an ultimate end goal. Oh, but yeah, great. Yeah, more a direction than a position yeah that's right that's right yes there's always gooder <laughs> or badder <laughs> yeah no that's great thank you that's really really interesting it's uh, uh gosh it's such a powerful word good isn't it just hearing that makes me think oh how much we um how much that little word packs in yeah something from anyone else Somebody. We had a live page bay, didn't we? Because um, I think when it was mentioned before, I kind of rushed off to my book and then we had a conversation about it, haven't read it yet. <laughs> Great to hear. Um, but we were, I think we were sort of collectively talking about um, what it can mean to others and how it can be, I suppose, in a business context, maybe a bit unskillful sometimes and maybe more skillful to use a range of words. And, you know, we were talking about, for example, with children, for example, if you say like that, you guys were, you know, well, that's good or that's bad. It doesn't really skill them. Whereas if you're in public, for example, and a child is behaving in a way that you think, oh, that might be causing distress to another. It's better to say, isn't it? Perhaps what it is, you know what? It would be perhaps better for other people if we didn't use those words here. Mm. Mm. Because otherwise it's just good or bad and it's not very skillful. So, yeah. I don't know. It doesn't like, sort of give that range and it doesn't sort of have that sense of process, does it? Yeah. That you're sort of pulling out. Yeah. But it's a judgment, isn't it? Yeah. Good is good. We're just not clear. That's as well, I'm not clear. Oh, that's good. And it's not clear. Yes, you spend your life you then navigating. <laughs> yeah. Navigating. Yeah. But so so there's something also about what Adele was saying, Adele was saying about um the idea of good and bad being imposed from the outside it might come from um the morality that's sort of passed down through uh the religion that we're being brought up in or in society's norms and things like that but there's yes yeah so oh, okay great sounds like you had a really interesting discussion we don't need to fix uh there's no fixed answer is there it's just good to get us started uh so question number two uh so I don't know who was here last week, but uh, last week our um, our speaker dropped out because uh, he was unwell. Actually, he had a, a death in the family, and then he was unwell. So we did an impromptu night with uh, three of us giving a talk, or a little talk each and throwing questions out like I'm doing here. Uh, and the theme that we looked at was um, uh, the Buddhist path condensed into three streams, which is uh, ethics, meditation and wisdom and uh, those three things can happen uh, all at once all together you practice all three but there's also a sense of progression in that path you start with ethics ethics is your base really that's that's uh you need to have a, a sort of an ethical sensitivity and sensibility because then you can move on to uh, having a sort of deeper, more effective meditation practice. And from that meditation practice um, comes wisdom. So, uh, well, maybe, uh, uh, so the first element is ethics. And uh, yeah, ethics as the beginning of the path. So I'm just going to throw the question back to you. Uh, 
again, you know, why, why ethics? Why, what does that mean to you if you hear that ethics is the, is the, uh, is the first step on the Buddhist path and the key part of, of the key, um, key practice? I was going to say, for us as beginners, we're all beginners. Yeah, so throw you back into your groups, six minutes, and um, Jeanette, I'll wave at you at five minutes and do this so that you can start to um, put, that do the last, the last minute to wind up the Zoom groups. Okay, so back we go. In okay, this time we're all, uh, all in groups. So I've moved you a tiny bit around. So um, yeah, have fun.
just waiting for Stephen to let us know that our friends online are back. Being very precise, you've got 45 seconds left. <laughs> I hope it's not like, you know, you sort of download something, 45 seconds left, 30 oh, seconds left, go. minute and a half left. <laughs> They're flooding in. They're flooding in. Great. So maybe, um, maybe if you could just stay there, Stephen. Maybe to turn to people online. It'd be interesting to know if anybody has a comment or a question that they could put in the chat, and maybe Stephen, you could take a moment to read that in a minute. But uh, for the those of us in the room, <laughs> be nice to hear from someone different this time. Uh, I wonder. Where you got with uh, thinking about ethics is the first step, the first part of the Buddhist path. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, great. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Stop here. Yeah, we came to the conclusion that it's because uh, when you live in the mundane world and you're busy, it's, you have to have some starting point. You can't just dive straight into something like meditation or enlightenment. Mm -hmm. so you don't have the foundation. Anybody can work foundation, no matter how busy mm. they are. Mm. What sort of foundation do you think it gives? Like, you you know, the, the kind of precepts and so on that allow even lay people, you know, Buddhist monks take many, many more precepts mm. than mm. lay people. So it allows just lay people to structure their lives in a way that is satisfactory. Yeah, yeah, great. Very good, thank you. Uh, I was second, I think. Oh, you, you were, I was second. You were, Unless you want. No, no, go, go, go. Yeah. No, we were just uh, talking about uh, how the ethics and wisdom are interconnected. Like to make a wise choice and to be ethical as well. Mm. That can come from. Do, and are they to so make a wise choice? Yeah, yeah. like we to make a. to bring the wisdom in your life. Uh, Ethics can help. Mm -hmm. Yes. Otherwise, if you're not ethical, then maybe you keep making wrong. Yeah, you, you're not really seeing what coming. Yeah, not yeah. really aware. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. it brings more awareness. Yeah. Yeah, and then a bit it's of also, wisdom yeah. arises from that. Wisdom arises from. But they're also interconnected. So it can't be just like wisdom, ethics, and compassion. They're quite interconnected. So it can't be just first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we were almost saying that like you've got to have, I think. A level of wisdom to understand maybe that some of your choices or things that decisions you make the way that you speak are maybe not as ethical as they could be <laughs> so it's almost like yeah you've got to have some kind of level of wisdom to sort of be aware of that in the first place it's great isn't it it's you yeah you, yeah, yeah exactly and it sort of um it augments and expands and deepens and yeah so the more wisdom you have the harder it is then to sort of uh is when you either do act a bit unskillfully or um yeah to choose to act like that you know you're going against what you know is uh you know the the most uh beneficial thing to do yeah great yes it's a nice little virtuous circle yeah yeah great i was saying that when i first got involved i wasn't interested in ethics in a sense of more interested in meditation or wisdom that's it as the time went on, I had to learn the, the significance and the importance of ethics, feeding into those things. Mm. And how did it feed in for you? What did what difference did that make? Well, it's in relationship to your views and your attitudes and how you think and speak and relate to others. Mm. Mm. And did that have a direct in, uh, impact on your meditation then? Or how did that happen? Over time, yes. Over time, yeah, great. In yeah. Sense, in a sense of learning, in a certain to say, because you know, ethics is bigger than in a certain sense. So it's about right views and it's about intention and attitude. So it's like if, you, if, you, if you're in meditation and you're saying the right thing, which is ethical, it has an effect. Mm. Yeah, yeah, great. It helps you abandon the ego, it makes you realize that you and everything else around you is interconnected that there is a responsibility between you and everything else. Mm, mm, mm. We'll unpack that a bit later, I think. That sounds great. Yeah. Anything from online, Stephen? Yeah, there's a couple of comments. Um, Sadaraja says intention is crucial in Buddhist ethics. And 
Dr. Udayamani and says, if it's natural to be a messy human, <coughs> then it's okay to fall down nine times with awareness, pick yourself up 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, may, maybe you could, could you repeat that if you remember it? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's on, on, on my, on my oh, yeah, side. great. Oh, yeah. So Stephen was saying, thanks online, uh, that Sadaraja says intention is key in Buddhist ethics, stealing my talk. And uh, um, Hridaya Mani says, uh, it's okay to be a messy human, which I think is just great. Thanks for bringing this in, Hridaya Mani. Uh, we fall down nine times with awareness and get up 10 times. Yeah, yeah, very good, yeah. So what I was gonna go on to sort of say is uh, what, what if ethics is not about what we do, but how we do something? So it's not that what we do doesn't, um, is, isn't important, but how we do something uh, can be even more, uh, more crucial to, you know the mental states that are behind it how we feel doing it and how it's received how it's received by the world so um that means that ethics then is about our lived attitudes and behavior our lived attitudes and behavior and um it's living from our values and actually as i've been preparing this and thinking about this i was like oh boy, I need to think about this again. <laughs> you know, you really sort of bring it up. And I've been trying to um, be a bit more graceful in the world somehow. It's sort of even just that, trying to be a bit more graceful. Uh, I, um, I noticed, I I'd sort of noticed before I thought about this, but I've noticed when I do the shower squeegee in the morning, I have resistance it's a it's a dull chore to do and so i do it with an attitude of aversion and it's noisy uh -huh, and i'm going to get it over as quickly as possible and then i started doing it exactly the same action but with just an acceptance that um it's you know just do it you know stop the resistance and actually it's quieter and I'm, I don't have all this sort of mental stuff going on in relation to it. It's a really small thing, but sort of uh, trying to bring more of that how I do something um, rather than, you know, to, to whatever I'm doing. Be, um, be nice to be able to really sort of, you know, be nice to be able to bring this in to sort of almost to everything I do, to, uh, you know, the phone calls you make, the, the interactions you have. It could be, you know, the way that you press down the... Um, the button on the kettle, you know, uh, what if I could do more of that with a, an intention of um, uh, actions have consequences with softness, with uh, connectedness to myself and the surroundings? Because if I do that and then, you know, do the kettle and then I turn around in the kitchen and someone's there, I'm sort of, it's not that that's bad, but I'm sort of abruptly sort of like, oh, you're there and I'm in that mode. But if I, Turn, just push the button lightly and turn around. Actually, that sort of has an, an impact on who I'm going to, the, the next thing that happens in my life. And it could, it's just the next person I meet who, you know, I've heard them, I know they're there, um, but just softens something or makes it a bit more connect. I'm, I'm a bit more uh, connected to myself. I'm a bit slower. I can be a bit more connected with the world around me. So I think this is a really interesting question, actually, about uh, our values. Do we know what our values are? Do we connect with our values and do we live from our values? So uh, I, um, I have a, a gorgeous niece and uh, when she was about 12, we were walking down the street and I have no idea how we got into this conversation, but I said to her, uh, what are your values? What, 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 what are your values? And she was great. She came up with three core values for herself. So her first value was kindness. We walked a bit longer and we, we walked across a crossing. And then she said, oh, optimism is important. And I um, you know she's very wise. And, uh, and then she went on she, and I was like, what about one more? What about one more? We walked along a bit more. And then she said, courage. So pretty good list, isn't it? So she, so, and um, I remind her of that. 
and then she remembers it as well. So uh, sort of, you know, helping with that because they're such great values, kindness, optimism and courage. And uh, to be able to live from that, and she's in, she's sort of doing her A-levels and I sort of try and bring this back to her a bit because she's, I'd say she's lost a little optimism. <laughs> but she might, she might bring it back. She might bring it back. And I think, uh, you know, we sort of, when we think about ethics and values, we might try and align them really closely with what we know about Buddhism. You know, I'm going to fit my values into a Buddhist framework. Uh, but maybe it's better to start with something that's really authentic and um, real to us. Uh, our teacher, Bhante Sangharakshita, who started the Tri Ratna Buddhist community, he had a real value with friendship. He, he talked about friendship as an absolute core value, the idea that one person can be friends with another person uh, and that he really believed that was possible for every single human being. And he said that he, um, this was a core value of his, a core belief of his, and that he would rather die than live without that belief. And that belief in um, the ability of humans to connect really guided his whole life. Now, it doesn't sort of sit just within a sort of like, oh, the five, fifth precept this or the fourth precept that. Uh, but it was a core value that he really um, he really identified within himself. So I think it's quite great, good for us to think about what our values are, really know what my values are, uh, and uh, be able to sort of step into them and live from them. And then, you know, we find the teachings that can really speak to us and we can live from them. We're living a, a Dharmic life, a Buddhist life that is um, coming from us not trying to not imposing the teachings um and trying to fit them onto us we sort of then can resonate with dharmic teachings buddhist teachings that uh, resonate with our values and and um you know we can explore this with ethics so uh yeah so we're going to you know live from our values and so for that, for that we of course need to know ourselves we need to get to know ourselves more we need to bring awareness to who we are and um, what makes us tick. Uh, so uh, I, I was reading and Subhadra Mati sort of said, um, in Buddhism, to be ethical is to be truly human. And to be truly human is to be ethical. So if we find what's sort of really valuable to us, we can live from that. And, um, and you know, it is progressive. It is, uh, it is unfolding. So just to remind you, uh, as I'm sure you do know, that um, our actions are actions of body, speech, and mind. So body actions, things that we do, uh, you know, with our yeah, with our with our physical being. Uh, speech is um, both sort of what we're writing, typing, you know, uh, behind closed doors and out to other people and texts and. Uh, our other communications as well as our actual speech and then mind mind is huge isn't it and my you know so buddhism brings shines a light on uh, our mind as well who we are in ourselves what our mental states are and we need you know these these mental states then um, do affect uh, our speech and our actions so we kind of we really really need to know what our mind states are what, who we are, um, who we are to ourselves in a way, although it gets shared quite easily <laughs> with our mind states. So uh, Buddhist ethics then uh, is, as Sadaraja brought out, is a, an ethics of intention. So uh, uh, the ethics, of, the ethics of see our actions of body, speech, and mind are seen as either sort of skillful. Uh, or uh, unskillful, you know, they're, they're, that's, and there's a spectrum, there's a broad range in there, but you can't necessarily identify them from the actual actions. You have to go back to what the intention is. Uh, so it's always good to ask people questions, isn't it, when you're sort of on the end of something that you're not quite sure what's going on and that didn't feel so good. You can inquire, um, you know, oh, what's going on? What, you know, uh, did you, you know, what, what's going on for you? What, you know, the, 
I was feeling a bit like this when you did that. And I thought, oh no, I was really intending to do something different. And then you can sort of get into communication rather than jumping to conclusions, being on the end of someone's um, actions and just feeling, uh, you know, a, a bit taken aback by something that's happened. Don't sort of jump to conclusions. Maybe it's always good to sort of ask, well, what's going on? And you can might find that actually the, <laughs> my, you know, my, the intention might be quite different to what, how you've perceived it or how, what the outcome is. We have to then be kind to each other and kind to ourselves with that. Uh, so yeah, we so you know for our own self, of course, we have to become more aware of um, of what our uh, what our internal landscape is, our emotional states and our moods, so that um, we're aware of that and how that affects our actions. But also, we can learn to practice um, keeping up the intent of our um, of our actions over time so that we're someone who can follow through, uh, follow through in our lives. And in that way, we become more integrated. And uh, there's not so much work to do to always be sort of checking stuff out with ourselves. We're bringing more and more self of ourselves on board by um, acting in accordance with our values, by uh, having a sense of what our emotional and mental states are. And then uh, by um, trying to sort of keep a sense of Con continuity with who we are as individuals uh, and uh, what we say we'll do, you know, how we act in the world. So uh, integration and responsibility, these two key aspects of, um, you know, uh, becoming aware of ourselves and starting to um, take on responsibility around our, our, ourselves and ourselves and ourselves in the world and our actions. So, uh, with this, of course, when we're acting more in accordance with our values and more in accordance with um, the Buddhist values that come through in the five precepts, uh, we then feel better about ourselves because we're living in, in harmony, not only with our own values, but with um, a sense of how things, uh, what, what's pointed out to us in the precepts about how things are, how, how, how we interact and how we uh, connect with, the, with ourselves and others in the world. So then it's easier to sit in meditation because we're more congruent and we're happy with ourselves and our mind, it's easier to settle. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I've definitely found that myself. So actions have consequences. This is the key, um, this is the key message of Buddhist ethics. So there's, so there's no um, authority that will judge you. There's no um, outside pressure that's going to decide what's good or bad, but your actions will have consequences. Even non-actions sometimes have consequences. So sometimes you think, oh God, I don't know what to do, or um, oh, I'll leave that over there. Those people can sort that out. Well, actually that can be an action as well. Actions have consequences. Everything has, in con has consequences. Um, yeah, so our intention and our awareness uh, really makes a big difference to um, our ethical, to our actions of body, speech and mind. And um, I was reminded of um, cycling down Hills Road. And uh, I had this thing, I, I would be cycling down Hills Road and I'd try, this didn't last that long, to be honest, because it was, <laughs> I don't know if it was a good idea, <laughs> but I was quite interested in the flow of traffic. It's a, it was, it's a busy road. Remember when we used to go to work? Uh, so uh, quite a flow of traffic. And uh, I was watching this particular cyclist and I, I um, felt like there was a bit of a trail of um, consequences to their actions <laughs> behind them. And as a cyclist, you can't see what happens behind you. But um, I was watching and I was watching all the other cars and the traffic and even the people adjusting to this person's cycling habits. And then I, I sort of, for a little while, I sort of got into a bit of a zone, sort of just trying to be there with this flow of traffic over a few days and things like that, doing that it wasn't something you could really carry on long term, but I quite enjoyed that sort of sense of, um, I, I didn't know what their intentions were as they were making the choices that they were making. Uh, and I think if you're in a car, you could see what's happening behind you. Perhaps you're not aware anyhow, because you're going to, go fast or make the choices you're making. But I was watching this whole thing. I was thinking, you know, it's a bit of a metaphor for life. Um, as I think, uh, you know, I'm going to make this move. 
everyone else has to sort of adjust around me. Uh, so hopefully, you know, I'm using my mirrors and I can sort of see what's behind me and what's in front so I can make good judgments. But then um, perhaps if I'm coming from a more self-referential point of view, uh, I don't really have mirrors and I'm just a cyclist or a scooter uh, person <laughs> and um, zipping through the traffic, uh, not really worrying about actions and consequences too much. I'm going to get there as fast as I can and I'm really fast. So I'm going to zip in and out of the traffic. And um, apparently there are no actions and consequences but actually there are, there are actions and consequences, you know, but, you, you know, um, especially if you're fast and uh, you can sort of zip through the traffic really easily, you think it doesn't really matter, but actually everyone's having to adjust everything. So I thought I really liked this. I thought this was a, little, a, a good metaphor for how we are in life and this sort of this interconnectedness, but also actions having consequences and we're all making adjustments all the time uh, to, it, to each other and how we are. So, uh, yeah, so as we practice ethics, uh, then uh, we sort of become more aware of our mental states. And of course, this has a positive effect because uh, we become more aware of our mental states. And so we can try and uh, uh, support uh, ourselves to, um, to have more positive uh, experiences, more positive mental states, more positive uh, emotional states and sense, sense of well-being. Uh, and we can notice a bit more sometimes when those things are not there, when we're sort of perhaps um, feeling a bit more closed down and a bit more self-referential, uh, a bit tighter. I was really thinking about when um, you're in that place and when you're acting from that, acting from that sort of sense of um, narrowness and self-centeredness, and perhaps, you know, you can sort of end up, you know, not quite telling the truth or, uh, you know, uh, not sort of quite uh, being as generous as you want to. You've got to really then guard that. It sort of uh, it augments itself as well. When you haven't sort of, uh, when you've sort of fudged the truth a bit, then you kind of have to guard that, make sure that you continue to fudge that same truth or whatever it is, you sort of get narrower and narrower and more isolated and separate uh, uh, when you're not sort of being so skillful. And then, of course, when you are able to sort of open up and connect again and uh, uh, be more truthful and be more generous, you're then more in, in, uh, in uh, connection with the world and with people and with yourself. So the states are more open and expansive. And of course, these are the, these, this is what we want to generate. We want to be mo more connected, more open, more expansive, more accepting of ourselves, more uh, in tune with the world and able to sort of go with whatever uh, life throws us. So, uh, yeah, so the word karma, just to sort of get in there with the word karma. <laughs> uh, so karma, we often think of, you know, as fate, or um, as a sort of a, a consequence of my direct actions. But in Buddhism, it's, uh, it's about um, our will or our actions that come from our awareness. So, it, so karma is, is action, but it's particularly action that has awareness with it, that's done with awareness. And so then the consequences of your actions are that is karma vipaka. So it's got these two aspects to it. It's got the action and then it's got the consequences of, the, of your actions. So if, um, if uh, I come along and uh, I bump you and you've got a cup of tea and your tea sort of spills and it's an accident, well, actually, um, the, my intention was not to do that. I may not have been very, been, been very mindful, but the consequences of that lack of mindfulness will not be as um, significant as if actually I have a moment of feeling um, hatred or anger or frustration and I deliberately um, bump you so that you spill your tea. So uh, it's the intention that, that counts. So then uh, if my intention, yeah, so the intention then affects the, um, the consequences that you will suffer. So you can imagine um, the next day I sit down to meditate and I've, you know, I'm really still thinking about this cup of tea that I've sort of 
spilt all over you. If it was an accident, um, I might be able to let it go and think I'm really going to try and be more mindful. But if I sit down to meditate and um, actually I know that I was um, uh, really annoyed with something or with you and I did that on purpose, how am I going to meditate? How am I, if that's playing on my mind, how am I going to meditate? You know, I'm going to either fall asleep <laughs> or um, be distracted or I'm just not going to sit down or I'm going to sit there and I'm going to think, wow, what was going on yesterday when I did that? What was going on? So, you know, sometimes things happen and you realise, God, I did that. That was, I, oh, <laughs> that was my willed action there. And uh, that was quite unskillful. So, you know, uh, hopefully in our Buddhist community, we do try to um, uh, be quite accepting with what happens. So if I, if I did notice, if, if I was aware that actually I did that on purpose and um, I was really annoyed with that person, if, uh, if they're experienced enough or even if not, I might go back and I might say, well, actually, about yesterday, I'm really sorry. Actually, I think I, 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 um, I was feeling really upset and I did that, in, did that, uh, that was an intentional act and we could talk about it. Uh, you know, that would be pretty, I feel like that would be pretty major, actually, to have intentionally bumped someone with their cup of tea. But um, I guess that happens, actually. You can intentionally do that with speech, can't you? Um, do the speech equivalent of spilling hot tea down someone you know you know well I've done it and you have to go back and you have to say you know uh, can we talk about this actually what I said yesterday was a bit outrageous and um, I can see that it really hurt you uh, I'm really sorry so it's a practice that we try and uh, try and do with each other actually is to bring that honesty uh, and uh, yeah, honesty and uh, build the bridges back, build the bridges back so that you're not out of harmony with people. It's not always easy because, of course, that person may, uh, you might have said, they might, they might be really upset. So then it's not just a matter of like, oh, don't worry. It's like, actually, you've done that before. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we, uh, we need to talk about this, you know. Yeah, so, you know, even as I talk about it, it's like, oh. So, uh, just to go on, because um, the, the uh, so that's the law of karma, and the law of karma is a, a really it's an it's a natural law. So when the Buddha sat down underneath the tree of enlightenment and he um, he meditated, and his deep insight at the time of meditation, at the time of enlightenment, sorry, his deep insight, the thing that shifted for him, the thing that sort of opened everything up was this deep knowing of deep, deep interconnectedness, that, uh, that nothing is fixed, everything's in a process of flow, uh, and uh, it's, it's a big process of flow, it's a whole sort of dependent arising, um, conditions arise, uh, and then things change, and those things pass away, and that's just constantly happening. Uh, yeah, the cup of tea is hot um, because I've put hot water in it and I've, you know, applied heat and it's got hot. And then when after over time, that cup of tea is no longer hot. Uh, the conditions have changed. Uh, and that's a linear thing. But actually, condition co-production, uh, the Buddha's vision was of this huge matrix <coughs> of conditionality. Uh, and uh, karma falls within this karma and ethics fall within this um, within this matrix of conditionality so it's not always easy to know what's going on so there the buddha also well uh, the buddha and then later on um, one of uh, one of the key uh, early buddhist teachers from the 5th century uh, looked at causality uh, looked at this, this sense of um, how things arise and fall. And he said, well, there are five different levels of, um, of conditionality. One is just um, uh, uh, inorganic, uh, inorg processes that are inorganic, like um, the law of gravity. 
that's just happening it's uh, it's um it's it's a conditioning factor and then of course there is um the processes that govern uh organic life so things like photosynthesis that's happening around us um we breathe um the, the world is alive in that sort of way and the third level is um of uh of conditioning factors is um the level of simple consciousness so um things like our instincts so uh when your mouth waters when you uh, smell food that you really like or um bird migrations this is a sort of simple ordinary consciousness and the two that we're really interested in with buddhist ethics is the fourth one which is um the relationship between our intentional actions and the effects of our actions so that's the the realm of karma and karma vipaka and then finally the natural law that means human beings can gain enlightenment so that is called the dharma niyama and uh i think we'll cover that at the end of uh, end of the series so karma actions and consequences fits into this um this uh uh this system of other conditioning factors so it's really important actually that um that uh we don't try and uh understand things just based on a sense of simple karma actions have consequences i can see you did this this is your karma that's a sort of um uh psycho psychology magazine sense of um of what karma is but karma is within this matrix of conditions and we can't always know uh what what the factors are um when something happens the cup of tea could fall because of an earthquake uh and then that would be nobody's fault actually that's tectonic plates moving and you and we don't have to subscribe any um any uh skillful or unskillful actions to that yeah so i hope this has helped uh see that um in your ethical life your mind and your mood and how you are really matters that's the key uh that's the key part of buddhist ethics um when we act more uh skillfully we're more open we're more uh connected to other people uh and um it gives us a sense it, 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 it there's a satisfaction actually in that and there's a happiness and a contentment in it and when we're unskillful it's it's a narrowing and a protecting of our um of our self and uh, we become more self-centered we become impoverished and narrow and protected and guarded as i was saying a bit earlier so buddhist doesn't have a need for an absolute ethical framework which puts things into good and to bad uh it's it's a it's a bigger system than that it's a uh, you know there's a lot more freedom in it there's a lot more responsibility in it uh yeah to go for it so you know buddhism asks us to examine our own experience to examine it deeply and uh become more and more aware of our intentions yeah